We need a revival in our thinking. We need to be revived in some things and, and our mindset and our attitudes. We need a revival in our, let me, if you put it to you this way, in our breathing, in our lungs. You know that you have to have breath to live. Amen? If you cannot breathe on your own, sometimes the doctors will put you on that ventilator to breathe for you. Uh, Spurgeon was once asked by a lady uh, who was trying to trip him up. She said, which one is more important, prayer or Bible reading? He sat there for a moment. He said, which one is more important to you, breathing in or breathing out? We need a revival in the very breath of our life. We need to take in the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit of God breathe out on us what He wants us to see. So I hope that you will just tune in and get your heart set. I know you've been praying. How many of you have been praying for this revival? You understand say you've been praying. Amen. We need to pray for these leaders. Vance Havner said this. Vance Havner, a preacher from years ago, back in the 70s now. In the 70s, he made this statement. He said, the dam is breaking in America. In the 70s now. Unless uh, we have, there is a spiritual revival, we might as well try to hold back Niagara Falls with a toothpick. The restraint of law and order is giving way. This is the 70s. The restraint of law and order is giving way. Our family life is crumbling. This was in the 70s. Our, ours is a day of secularism and humanism, which is defined as the practice of the absence of God. That's in the 70s. With our technology, he said, our know-how, our expertise, we are producing, he said, brain-boggling gadgets. But the real problem, he said, is sin. He said the real problem is sin, and science has no answer for sin. I believe the writer was correct in 1 Peter when he said this in chapter 4, that for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if, if it first begin at us, what should the end of it be that obey not the gospel? The revival that we need must start right here in this room, right here in our hearts. I want us to look at chapter number 61 of the book of Psalms this morning. If you're there, say amen. Uh, the psalmist David, in his writings, uh, many times is crying out, many times he's praising, many times he's declaring the glory of God. And in this psalm, he makes a statement. I, I have not been able to escape, and what I mean by that is, I've been tripping over these verses everywhere I've turned in the last several weeks. Through messages that I've listened to, through testimonies that I've heard given, through uh, the process of our family devotions and verses that we have looked to for strength in these uncertain days. In these days where depression is real, where uh, the downheartedness, not just of the regular American, but the church member, the, the, the downheartedness is palpable. It is a common thing now for churches to be on a low rather than at a high just because of the situation that's around us. And I believe uh, David gives us a heart's cry in these verses of chapter 61. Look with me in verse number 1. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Let's pray just for a moment. Lord Jesus, now you know I need you. God, you know my flesh is weak and it will fail. And God, the only consolation, consolation I have is if this only depended on me, God, we might as well all go home. But I depend on you. These people depend on you. Lord, if we're to see anything from your word and to know anything from you in these days where a church needs revival, it'll be because the word of God does its work and the Holy Spirit of God is allowed to do his work in the hearts 
of men and women and boys and girls. Lord, I pray you challenge us in this time. Help us to see our need of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter number 61 of Psalms. How much time? What time do I need to be done, preacher? 1020. All right. This psalm, <laughs> Psalm 61, the psalms, as we know, uh, can be correlated many times to specific events in David's life. We know that, right? His time in the cave at Adullam when Saul is on, on the path, uh, on his heels. His time when he sinned against God with Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan said, Thou art the man. There are psalms that are matched up to the events in David's life. And I believe this psalm, and I would agree with many commentators and writers, is a psalm that would have been written and historically, traditionally, it's accepted that this psalm was written when David was on the run from his own son, Absalom. Uh, the kingdom was in disarray. The government of the kingdom was, was being disheveled. The alliances and the allegiances to the king were being taken away and shifted and divided. And it's much like a time that we have now in our country when our people are divided on issues and they're following some in one camp and they're following some in another camp and there is great division and there is great adversarial confrontation between people. And David finds himself in a situation I am sure that he never thought he would see himself in. He saw and made his mind back in those days when he faced down a bear and a lion protected his father's sheep. He saw back in his mind a day when he stood toe to toe with a nine foot giant with nothing but a sling and a stone. He saw a day when he slayed his tens of thousands. He saw a day when he was a mighty warrior for God. But in here, in this day, all the things of stability in his life, the thing that made him who he was, is now turned against him. Everything was out of the ordinary. Nothing would ever be the same. Absalom, his son, has stolen away the heart of the people from King David. And now, King David is being chased the warrior poet, the man after God's own heart, is being chased by his own son. What a despairing set of events. And so what does David do during this time? What does David do during this time of despair and despondency and danger in his life? He does what we ought to do at all times whether it be in rejoicing, whether it be in thanksgiving, whether it be in times of brokenness and despair, and that was he called upon the God of heaven, which had always been his help. And he said this in verse number one, Hear my cry, God. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. I want you to see if you're a note taker this morning. This is David's plea. This is David's plea that he makes unto God. There is an asking in this prayer. There is a desire that is within this prayer. Now I want, you to, I want you to see this morning, I mentioned it already in some introductory thoughts, the importance of prayer in the life of a Christian. The importance of prayer goes beyond now I lay me down to sleep. The importance of prayer goes beyond God is good, God is great, let us thank Him for our food. The, the, the importance of prayer goes beyond that opening uh, a thought before a kickoff of a game. That importance of prayer goes way beyond when we've run out of other options. David always, almost without fail, and we can track the times when he did not seek God first in prayer and see the failure in his life. But David goes back to where he had been so many times. He goes to God with a plea and with a desire, with a prayer, with, a, with a, 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 an asking that he has. I believe that it's not taught well enough to young Christians. And I believe it's not reminded enough of senior saints the importance of the armor of God when it pertains to prayer. Now we've talked about that. Turn if you want to over to that Ephesians chapter 6 in those verses. I believe it's 11 through 18. Uh, you can turn over there if you want to. Let's just look at it. Ephesians 6 verse 10 through 18. 
Paul writing to that church at Ephesus. Now, many times, uh, we, we maybe see these verses as a, a means of daily defense as we walk out into the world. But I'd like to point out that this armor of God that Paul is describing, this whole armor of God, is designed to be put on and used in and through prayer. See, the battle is not necessarily the, where we step out there. We're going to face conflict. We're going to face adversaries. We're going to face some, re, uh, some re, re, rebuff from the world if we're a born-again child of God. But the battle belongs in the prayer closet. The battle really starts in our secret place of prayer. Then Paul wrote these words in verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. And he's going to tell us where that comes from, where that strength starts, where that strength is drawn from. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be, uh, uh, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You think the devil wants you to pray? No, he doesn't want you to pray. Where did the devil come to in Jesus' life most visibly? In his 40 days in the wilderness of temptation when he went away to fast and pray for 40 days. Where do we see the devil show up again in his time in the garden when he's praying unto the Father? And he's coming after you when you come to pray. He doesn't want you to pray. He wants you to be distracted. He wants you to be taken away in thought. But the armor must be put on when we get into prayer in the beginning of our day. It says there, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Are we seeing that today, my friend? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all. To stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, above all, above all, listen, 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 above all, taking the shield of faith that you might quench the fiery darts of the enemy. You know why? Because on your own, you cannot stand up against the devil. You can't. He's your enemy, he is our adversary. He said that, that shield of faith. Stand therefore. Uh, take the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How did Jesus combat the devil in the wilderness? It is written. You know what? The devil cannot take you farther than the truth of the Word of God. He might bring up your past. He might bring up your sin. He might try to tell you that you can't. And you know what? He's right. But the one thing that he cannot refute, the one thing that he cannot come back with in truth is the truth of the Word of God. Why did the psalmist David say in 119.11, I, I will hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Word of God is our defense against the devil. So take that in this time. I got to hurry. Woo. I thought I had plenty of time. I did. We got plenty of time. Notice in this plea there is the prayer that is, has to do with an altitude, a direction. Look at back there in verse number one. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He is crying unto God. Now, David had lots of counselors. David had lots of trusted friends. He had his mighty men. I encourage you, if you want a good Bible study, you, you study those mighty men of God, of David, that he had around him. He had people that he could trust. He had people like Nathan who would tell him the truth. He had people that he could go to for advice. But he had nobody like God. And I will tell you this today. If you uh, go anywhere aside from God, you're taking a step down. If you try to turn to any other way besides the Lord God, you're taking a step down. If you try to seek any other counsel than from God, I have to tell you, they may be a trusted friend. They may be a valuable family member. They may be faithful in your life. But Every person is a step down from the Lord Jesus Christ. You're removing yourself. You're declining if you're going any other direction. Any direction we turn is a step down from God. Every man, every voice, every source, 
every plan. No one. Let me just say this. I would say the percentages are somewhere in the neighborhood of some percentages of a virus. Eh, I'm not going to talk about that virus this way. I'm not going to do it. The percentages are extremely low of people who go to a church because they want to hear a more truthful preaching of the Scripture. People don't go to another church because they want higher standards. People don't leave one church to go to another because they want to hear straighter preaching. People don't go to another church because they see greater service and, and unity. They don't go to another church because they want to go to church more. They don't leave churches and go to other churches for any of those reasons. People leave churches usually to go to another church. Because it was a little, uh, ugh, that preacher, he just said too much about certain things. I just, uh, this preacher over here, he don't say so much about that other stuff. Teach me, brother. Amen? But when we go to prayer, we're coming to a, a place of high altitude of truth. We're coming to the source of holiness and righteousness and truth. And whether we want to hear it or not, God's truth is always true. There is this place that he comes to. He says, I am overwhelmed in verse 2. How many of you ever come to the place in your life where you said, that's it, calf rope, I'm done. I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I'm done. I'm tapping out. Overwhelmed. I've been there, my friend. You're not looking at it, some sort of high-powered evangelist who's got all this figured out, who's got every problem solved, who's got everything just copacetic, who's got every situation sealed up. No, my friend. I get overwhelmed. And if you'll be honest, you get overwhelmed at times in this world that we live in. He's come to a place where his ability is deficient in light of God's help. He reaches a place where he says, Lord, I can't. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not good enough. I need your help. I'm overwhelmed. And it didn't take long for David to get to the place of being overwhelmed. You know why? Because he always knew where his source of power and strength was. It wasn't in the sword. It wasn't in the sling. It wasn't in the scepter of his kingdom. It was in the Savior of the world. That's where he gained his strength. When he came to the place where he was overwhelmed, he went to verse 3 and he found the place of protection that he had always known. Notice what it says there in verse number 3. It says there, For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. He's talking not just about a place here. He's not just talking about now his prayer, but he is recalling the protection that God has been to him in his life. He said he called it a shelter and a strong tower. That is a, a picture of a fortress that was not easily overtaken. And it was a place, a tower is a place of what? Is it a place where you go down? It's a place where you go up. It's a high place. Get me up above this. Have you ever been in a crowd of people and you can only see, I remember back at Christmas time, I had the failing of judgment and I listened to my family who dearly wanted to go to New York City for Christmas. <laughs> I don't recommend it. And we ended up down there on Fifth Avenue on Christmas Day walking around New York. And literally, it got so bad that I had tracks in my pocket. You know what gospel tracks are, don't you, amen? I had a gospel track in my pocket, and I had my family locked arm in arm, and I had that track in front of me, and I was literally pushing people like cows moving through the herd just to get through, and I could not see my way past three people. It was a claustrophobic feeling. It was a feeling of being contained that I did not like, and I couldn't see what was just ahead. But if I'd have had some altitude, <laughs> I've always been a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not really, really basketball tall. But I've got a level of altitude where short people got, you know. I, I, I can see things that other people can't. When they're going, what are they doing? What are they doing? I'm saying, I got it. I got it, buddy. See some things sometimes. But for us to be able to see, we need God to get, us, to get us above our circumstances, to get us above our overwhelmed condition, get us out of the water that we're drowning in and take us to a high tower of protection where he is. Quickly, 
The Rock. The Rock. Look at our, if I can have a title for this message today, it's in verse number two. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher. It's a place of protection. It's a place of dominance. If you hold the high ground in the military, you have an advantage of dominance on your adversary. And remember who our adversary is? Is it people? No. It's the devil. And you know what else it is? It's us. The devil don't bother me so much. He's, he's one entity. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He's one entity that can only be in one place at one time. Now, he's got a spiritual realm that's very, very well connected. I mean, it's got more communication than Facebook. You know what I'm talking about? But I tell you who gives me the most trouble. It's the, it's the beleaguered fella I look at every morning in the bathroom mirror when I think, did Angel put a picture of the Statler brothers in here while I was asleep? I all you old timers, all you carnal old timers know what I'm talking about. It's me. I'm the problem. I'm the weak one. I'm in this flesh. I have the Spirit of God dwelling within me as a child of God. But I'm still in this flesh. And sometimes I have to let God get me a beyond and above my flesh and the voices of my flesh and the temptation of my flesh and the carnality of my flesh and take me in the Spirit. And I'm not talking about some kind of spooky hocus pocus thing. Don't get me wrong, people. Listen to me now. If you've never been in a state of prayer where God has revealed to you things that your mind could not overcome and he's taken you spiritually and he's encouraged your spirit and he's spoken to your spirit and he's informed your spirit and he's let you see things in his word that energize the spirit within you, you need to get unto the high tower of God. It's a place of dominance. I would give several references. If you want to go some references, go to 2 Samuel chapter 22, uh, verse 2. There's some great references that David makes to the rock. I, I, one of my favorite references in 1 Samuel 2, 2, where Hannah was praying a, a songful prayer of victory when God had answered her prayer for a man child. And she said this, Neither is there any rock like our God. We need to go to the rock. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I when protests are going on around. Lead me to the rock when I'm afraid to walk into a group of people in a store because I don't know what happens. Lead me to the rock when I'm nervous about getting out at a gas station because I don't know who's in the cars around me. Lead me to the rock because I don't know what's going to go on on November the 3rd. Lead me to the rock of high protection when my spirit is down, when my lost family won't listen, when my friends turn away because of my standard and stand. Lead me to the rock. Isaiah chapter number 2 verse 10 said, enter into the rock. If you study the life of David, you know that when Saul was chasing him, he came to a cave called Adullam by himself. But it wasn't long that till he got company. His family came to him. And then there were 300 of the most despondent, deadbeat, indebted, discouraged bunch of... If you don't think God likes alliterated sermons, just go read about that. Man, that's all... God alliterated that out for you so good. And he found strength. Where? In the rock. Now that's symbolic and that's a picture of things. But I'll tell you where I get my protection. It's not in this peace of mind. I don't get my peace of mind from Fox News. I don't get my peace of mind from a political party. I don't get my mind from a sports team. I don't get my peace of mind from my family all the time. I don't get my peace of mind from friends all the time. I don't get my peace of mind from an economy or Wall Street. My peace of mind comes. The strength that I need comes when I get in the rock of God and I dwell in the rock and I find my comfort and my protection in the time of need. Look at verse number four quickly he said I will abide in thy tabernacle forever I will trust in the covert of thy wings Selah. what a 
What a power-packed verse. He's talking not just about a place of protection and dominance. He's talking about a property of his life. A piece of property in his life. The tabernacle. That wilderness tabernacle. At this point, you know, you Bible readers know, David did not build the temple. His son Solomon did. David went to God unto the existing tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. David frequented the ark and frequented the tabernacle. Why? Because he sought God there and he knew the glory of God would come there if the sacrifice was brought correctly. He said, I've got a place that I'm going to. Look what he said there in verse number four. I will abide in thy tabernacle. You know what that means? I'm living, I'm practically living there. I'm living in that tabernacle. I want to be in that tabernacle. Let me tell you something. These weeks where we had to be out of our church building because of all this stuff, and y'all, hey, y'all were probably in kind of the similar situation we were. Y'all were building. We were remodeling at our church, Wahoo Baptist Church in Murrayville, Georgia. Don't laugh. That's an Indian name. It's been around for 201 years in October. 201 years. 201 years, that church. It's a place that really the sheetrock and the studs and the shingles and the electrical outlets and the sound system and even the pulpit does not hold the power. But I'm telling you, my friend, that is a place that is dear to me. And when I could not go in there, it squeezed my heart to a point where I thought I would just absolutely die if I could not get to church. I do not understand how people can make a lower priority of the church house of God. I do not understand and I cannot fathom why anybody would try to find something else better to do than to come to church and hear a group of singers sing praises unto God and see fellowship of the saints that we need and hear a message from the word of God from the man of God he said I want to abide in that tabernacle but I can't always be at church we can't always abide in this place know you not that your body is the temple of God this is so wonderful I love this he abides in us and we abide in him. Whew. Riddled me that, Riddler. How does that happen? Good friend of mine, Brother Dean McNeese, he's an evangelist. He said it this way. He said, you've ever seen a, a little woman with child? And you can see the evidence of it, but you can't see that baby. But that baby shows up on that mama. You know there's something in there. For me, it's mostly Mexican food. But for her... Laugh right there. You may not get me more time for Jews to laugh this way. But for her, there's something alive in her. And you may not can see it, but it's there. And that's how we are with God in heaven because we are in Jesus and he is in us. We are in heavenly places. When we pray, we are spiritually speaking in the throne room with God. You understand that? Why? Because we are in Jesus. We are hidden in Christ. And he is in us. But you know what? We can forsake his voice that abides within us. We can choose not to listen. We can neglect that relationship. But he abides. He abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. David said, I will abide. Not just in a place, but in a person. There is a dedication to the tabernacle, this place. And there is a defense that we find. He said, under the covert of thy wings. The, the roops. Uh, you folks that remember this, ever hear the Southern God, if you don't, if you don't know who the roops are, R-U-P-P-E. It's our family name. They sang a song years and years ago called Under His Wings. Whew. If I didn't think it was too carnal, I'd pull up YouTube and just let y'all watch it right here. Hey, look. Some of y'all may not be raised in rural atmospheres. I feel sorry for city kids that never had a chicken. I do. I really do. I mean, you were raised probably like cats and stuff. I mean, 
I'm not mad at you if you're a cat person, but there's just something about chickens. Listen to me now. Chickens care for their babies. And when they have a, a, little, a little hatching of chicks, those chicks will stay right there around that mama. And if the wind gets a little bit too high, y'all might have to Google it to see the picture if you've never seen it. Literally, those little babies, she'll hunker down on the ground and those little babies will get down under her and she'll cover them over with her wings and they're safely protected. And it's not uncommon that a little hen will take a brunt of debris that takes her life, but her chicks are saved. He said, God, I need you like that little mama hen just to cover me with your wings. Just cover me over with your wings. I need a place of protection under the person that is my protection. There's a defense under his wing. And notice this, I love this. That word right there, Selah. Selah. You know, I was in my 30s, Brother Travis, before I ever heard a preacher explain Selah. Selah. You know what they do right there? These are songs. These are songs. They sung this. This was the songbook of the Hebrews. And when they get to that point and they start thinking about how God was their defense and God was like that mother hen that covered them under their wings, they would become so overwhelmed that he would just write in Selah right there. You know what that means? Just stop for a minute and praise him. Just pause for a minute and thank him. Just take a moment and just take a time to lift up your hands and praise God with a loud voice and to weep and cry and to give him adoration that he deserves. It's a place of pause in the music to think about what those words mean, about who they are about. It's a pause to praise, but it's also a pause to ponder. A pause to ponder. I think one of the greatest issues that we face amongst the people of God is unthankfulness and ingratitude. If you think I'm off base on that, you just look at the political environment of the people, a bunch of people who give no thought to the blessing that their life is in Amer as an American and want to destroy it and they have no idea of how much of a blessing it is to be born here or to come here and live here. That was nothing of their doing. And yet they get to reap the benefits. And they forget that people bled and died so you and I could live in here and come into this place and worship God freely. That's why Veterans Days and Memorial Days are so important. It's important to thank those men and women in uniform. And I'm not getting political here, but it's a time when we ought to remember some things. There's a history that David has with God. And he says, folks, y'all just praise him for a while. I just got to thank him for looking down on me as a little boy and giving me a purpose and an anointing in my life to become who I am today and giving me protection through all those battles. I look back at that day and how foolish I might have been fleshly when I stood before that giant. But my God stood with me and he was the victory for me that day. I've just got to stop and remember all the good things that God's done for me. Say love. Stop and think about what God's been for you. Now, we also have to think in these moments. David's in a predicament. I want to leave you with this. David's in a bad place. And I believe we should do what he does many times. And many times in his psalms, it seems like he's almost like bipolar, schizophrenic or something like that because he goes from like, oh God, I'm the lowest worm belly in the world to, oh God, you've been victorious in my life. He's up and down. He's up and down in a lot of those psalms, right? Bless his heart. You know what David does that I think that we ought to try to do? When we get in these places, I think we ought to take a little self-examination and we need to say, Lord, is all this right here self-inflicted? Not everything that happens to you is somebody else's fault. Let's just put this in practical terms. You make bad financial decisions, 
you're going to have a bad financial result. You eat a bag of ruffles and a tub of sour cream and onion dip and a two liter of Dr. Pepper before you go to bed every night, you're going to create yourself a collection of physicians. You're going to have a whole new group of friends who all prescribed you stuff and say, you can't eat that no more. And you know what? That has nothing to do with genetics. It has to do with that hole under your nose that you can't keep stuff out of. That's self-inflicted. You know what? You don't drink, you won't get drunk. You won't become an alcoholic if you don't take a drink. You won't become an addict if you dare take that first hit. You never do that, you'll never become addicted to it. Is this Lord self-inflicted? You know what, if I've got a destructive personality and I'm, and I'm overly sarcastic and I'm hateful to people, you know what's going to happen to me? People are not going to like me. They're going to avoid me. They're going to say, you have to sit by them at dinner. That, you're the reason that people have to call ahead and say, now, Mama, no, look, I know it's Thanksgiving, but is Charlie going to be there? <laughs> Mama, is Charlie going to be there? Because if Charlie's going to be there, I'm not coming until 3 o'clock. Save me a plate. Is this self-inflicted, Lord? Did I do something here, Lord, for my son? And I would say David's probably got some culpability in this situation. You know why? Parenthetical thought. We're almost done. Parenthetical thought. Here's the thing about David. You study his life. The only peace he ever got was because he destroyed somebody. The only peace he ever knew in his kingdom is because he killed other kingdoms. David, look at me, David had no idea how to achieve peace without destruction. And when his own flesh and blood turned against him, he did not, he had plenty of swords, he had plenty of armor. I think he probably still had Goliath's sword back there. But he couldn't talk with his own son and resolve that relationship. Think about that. David, the man after God's own heart. Why do you think God wouldn't let him build the temple? I'll tell you why it says. Because you've been a man of war and blood. You cannot achieve peace except that you kill somebody. Is it self-inflicted? Maybe. Is it, Lord, mm, spiritual training? This is back to us now. Is this spiritual training? Is this something you're allowing me to go through? Is this a, is this a, a strengthening trial? Guys don't get to where they can bench 300 by holding a remote control all day. Kids don't become physically fit sitting in their little recliner deal with that video game all day. They have to actually do something physical to become physically fit. Now, I despise people. I, I'm not looking directly at people, but I see some people that are probably skinny as a bean pole and they can eat whatever they want to and never get... Mm, I don't like those people. There's something wrong with you. You got a tapeworm or something. I'm jealous is what it is. But is this spirit training for me, Lord? Is this a test? Is this something that you're doing to make me stronger or to give yourself glory that I have to endure and suffer? So many people think that the Christian life should not include suffering, but Paul said, after you have suffered a while. Paul said that I might be found in the fellowship of his sufferings. Sometimes we're going to suffer for the glory of God and for the sake of his gospel. God, which one is it? So verse 5, and then we're done. For thou, O God, has heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Here it is. What's my plan for the future? I, I, I've come to you with my plea, Lord. I've come to you in prayer. I see you as my protection. I'm taking hold of the place, the property of, of my, your defense, Lord. 
Where do I go from here? Where do I go from here? What is my plan spiritually? What is my plan for the service that I render going forward? What is my plan to submit to you in a way that I haven't before? What is my plan? I'll, I'll leave you with this little thought here. There is a design to this. Thou hast heard my vows. There is a direction and a design to how David intends to live beyond this situation. I'd like to ask you a question. Weeks and weeks we didn't go to church. The country is literally coming apart. The democracy, the republic is in danger of crumbling. Has it caused you to pray more? Don't raise your hand. Has it caused you to read and study your Bible more to maybe figure out where we are in this thing? If not, I'm not trying to be mean, but let me be very direct. What's the matter with you? What's wrong with you if you're not praying more? What is your problem if you're not studying the Bible more in these last days? Hey, revival, you know where it begins? Right here in this house. And you know what we need to do? We need to take stock of some things. Every one of us has situations in our life. Brother, pre brother preacher over there had hands up. I got both hands and a foot. Hey, babe, we got problems. You've got problems. You've got diseases either in your own body or in somebody you love. Some of y'all have people and family who's going through things like dementia and Alzheimer's and cancer and leukemia. Some of y'all know children who are deathly sick. Every one of us knows somebody's had this stinking virus. We've got problems. There's some people in this room probably who have lost a job or lost some sort of financial standing. Some of you have got family conflicts. And if you don't, I'd like to see your playbook. And it's overwhelming, isn't it? Where do we go? We go to the rock that is higher than 